Landscape is permeable. There's no one landscape. We drive 95 from New York to Florida, and if we did that twice every year, the landscape would constantly be changing because of the construction or the demolition or the seasons. So landscape is dynamic, and it's the container for all diverse things to coexist. I mean, that's what it is. So we're all inside of this bubble together. Hello, everyone. It's Christine Marie Mason, your host for the Rose Woman podcast. Every week we talk about something that could bring a little bit more love, liberation, freedom into our lives, maybe knock out some taboos that aren't helpful. And this week is no exception. We're going to be talking with artist Elizabeth Condon about her work, her paintings, and also some of her life philosophy. Now, you know I love talking to artists because artists play a very specific role in culture. They sit out at the edges and with the right brain, they see often in imagery uh, fully formed concepts of what's happening in the field, what the world is uh, waking up to, what's in the subconscious of the world, and they're bringing it to our attention in a way that it can really land in people. So if you're an art lover, you know that already. And then if you start talking to creators about their why, it goes very philosophical very quickly. And I, I'm always learning from, from artists. They take in their environment in such a unique way and blend it up and whip it up and then create something magical. So um, Elizabeth Condon, in our interview, said, I asked her a little bit about creativity, and she said, creativity, well, it, it's just being alive. And that part of the interview, I think, is, is really something to kind of hone in on as you're listening. Like, like creativity is being in this flow and force of creation, the growing, changing, interdependent creation that, you know, we're, we're breathing together, we're having all of these experiences and like constantly working on each other, colliding with each other, uh, taking in sensation, giving it back, planting seeds, growing new things, cross-pollinating. And that if you're really listening and then you're taking what you're hearing into your own experience and then letting them collide, something new will be born from you. And in that way, you stay fully engaged and turned on, turned on. So many years ago, I went to the Nobel Museum in Stockholm, and they had an exhibit on where creativity comes from. And the exhibit said, basically, it comes in times that hyper-focus you, uh, that it's either, or, or great discoveries, Nobel-winning discoveries. So that was surprisingly uh, either in a highly catered situation where you didn't have to worry about a lot of things, like an elite university and everything's provided for you, or even in places where uh, t- it was a, t- a wartime, a lot of innovation in wartime where many other distractions were stripped away and you had to really focus on the task at hand. But other research says that creativity and innovation or an even derivative creativity that builds on top of something else, uh, not you know, sprung from a raw seed kind of creativity happens at collision points, you know, where different disciplines collide in port cities at the borders of countries. Like you, if you go to the U S Mexican border, the, you know, it's a very vibrant and alive blend of things when two cultures find each other and begin to uh, cross pollinate lots of joy there also. And, and, and lots of discussion over what people really believe and what they value. So how do you engineer collision? How do we engineer environments of cross-pollination? How do we make gardens where one breed of flower is right next to the other? That's what we're trying to do with Sensing Woman, a multidisciplinary encounter. When I was putting the show together, I did a thesis on what are the levers that we can pull to unwind these unhelpful stories around women's embodiment, sexual shame, all of the things that stop us from living our healthiest and most free life. And of course, that's morphed into complete look at women's health and wanting um, wanting freedom in, in that regard for all of us. The levers that we have represented include religion, media, education, uh, policy and law, eco-philosophy, eco-spirituality more than just philosophy, because we're trying to create a space that also lives what it's preaching, there's also 
interactions between the participants in a much more circular way and their evening events where there's more dropping into the body. I'm so excited to have a storytelling night, a sound media night, and a a rap priestess Lizzie Jeff coming in and dropping us into silks and lace, a very different sort of feeling tone of the embodiment, and and that our dialogue will have a different flavor when the conversation around law collides with a silk kimono, when that conversation around medicine collides with laying on the floor and meditating, and when the conversation uh, around media strategy collides with women telling their very own stories. So I really want you to come and enjoy it and, and be moved by it. You can find tickets at sensingwoman.org. So onward now to our conversation of the day with Elizabeth Condon. Well, it's so lovely to meet you. And thank you in advance for uh, bringing your beautiful artwork to Sensing Woman. We're very excited to have you in it. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be in it. And I've really enjoyed getting to know Rosebud Woman. And I'm honored to participate. How did you meet Christina or did she find you? I met Christina through the art world, and I'm not sure exactly when. I've been aware of her blog for quite a long time, and of course, of her as an artist. And she's very involved in the art world, and I am too, and so we've crossed paths many times. I think in 2018 or so, maybe 2019, she featured me on the blog, and I was so moved by that. And then in 2020, when she did the postcard mailing project, I participated in that, which was during the pandemic, and it was people teaming together to make collaborative paintings. What was that about? I don't think I heard about that from her. Can you explain it? Yes, it was a huge project that she devised, which was, I'm trying to remember the parameters now, but I think that two people or more would collaborate on these paintings that were a certain size, maybe larger than postcard size, but, you know, seven by 10 or, you know, kind of a small range on paper. And so she organized these exhibitions where people would send their submissions in and the exhibition would feature all of them. And they were, I'm talking thousands, you know, major traveling exhibitions. This is what she did during her pandemic year. And I can't remember what it was called now. I don't, I'm, I'm just not remembering anything about it, but that I participated in it. It was very well organized. And I believe the format could actually be any format because I remember doing a book for one of them, uh, like a folding book with a friend. But anyway, she brought all these different artists together through this mail art because, of course, it was at the time, too, I think, when the post office was under investigation or attack. Yeah, and under Amazon siege. Yeah. You know, everybody's staying home. But what a wonderful commentary on friendship and on aleatory living. You know, just taking a little bit of something you get and then being in response to it like an improv, like a yes and. Yes, definitely that. So your work, now it's very hard on a podcast to give people a sense of visuals. But um, I'll I'll try to do, a a, 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 imagine a very, very large, like almost a wall-sized piece And it has this intersection of grids, almost could look like an abstracted cyclone fence or a weaving or a net, so kind of structured. And then these huge floral organic layers over it is the the most recent set I saw. Very vibrant and such an interesting yin-yang combination in what you're doing. So I wondered if you might tell us about the pieces that you have in the show and sort of what's behind them. I will. And thank you for your description, because the pieces in the show are smaller than those large paintings, but they derive directly from them. So moving back a little bit, I start my paintings with a random gesture, usually a pour of color. So I'll have a fresh translucent color and I'll pour it on a blank canvas lying on its back on the floor so it creates beautiful shapes and those shapes give me a lot of imagination and sometimes meaning they fire my imagination and sometimes I'll build a lattice pattern what you're referring to as the fence on top of that and it'll be a face-off between order and disorder or the found and the intentional to 
offset a wallpaper of my mother's from childhood with the randomness of poured paint, which more often than not turns out to resemble flowers in some form. So I've been taking those two points and making paintings from them in a pretty spontaneous manner. I just let the paint guide me in terms of imagery and specifically to the paintings that are in the Rosebud Woman show, the larger one at 27 by 23 inches, which for me is a small painting. That painting was had a different evolution. It came from a series of pores and the color was so subtle and beautiful that I kept it on my studio wall for maybe two years. I often paint on a very um, finely woven portrait linen, but that painting is canvas and the canvas absorbs the liquid pores in a dynamic and exciting way. And I had these subtle colors and I was looking at it literally for years. And then I think in the spring I started working on it and then it became very difficult. I poured this huge clotted clump of brown and umber, well, kind of an umber paint. And then I, I created a problem basically. And then I had to paint myself out of it. And I've really felt like it was a problem, but I started to work with it as a flower shape. And long story short, I came up with an image that was so exciting to me of this big flower that almost looked like there were, instead of the stripes on petals that come naturally with the coloring of petals, it was like spider legs crawling over the petals, creating stripes for the petals, but also becoming its own being, like that the flower was a spider. And I love, and I put a lattice on the background that was a very beautiful counterpoint to the flower. And it, it felt both uh, gritty and beautiful to me in a way that I was really excited about. And then the other painting, um, Wildflower, was I bought some stretchers, very small, like eight by 10 inches, and, um, but, but very nice linen. And I poured, I poured paint on top of those, but because the space to work was, is so small at eight by 10, I would use a lot of drawing to shape the flower, meaning, you know, I would have small brushes and, or swish the brush back and forth like a, in Chinese painting, they call it Phi Bei, flying white, where the brush striates and creates a kind of grid or lattice pattern on its own and then paint in the petals and so forth. But then I would also take a palette knife, like a flat knife tool in painting, and then scrape it across the surface to create a little bit of dissonance or grit or just randomness in the painting so that the so that the flowers aren't too tidy. You know, they're 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 urban flowers like life, not too tidy. Right. <laughs> I mean, you're, the words you're using, like random, spontaneous, being like being guided, they all speak to sort of the nature of creativity. I, I wonder if you have some thoughts on creativity, your own creative process, where ideas come from. Creativity is an amazing process because it really is just being alive. And in terms of painting, I mean, I went to art school and I taught you know, at university and had all these sort of academic experiences about how one might be formally guided through the process. But in truth, it's, it's life. It's just an outcome of life. And so, for example, when I went to art school, I felt that, that painting was a matter of figuration or drawing well, or some kind of tick mark that you could check. But now I just think it's the ability to really listen to your own, just to absolutely be open to whatever it is you're doing, which is more challenging than one might think. People think of art as a process of freedom, and indeed it is, but it's not without the struggle of being able to support and recognize that and allow it to happen. So I think creativity is just really opening the channel towards that kind of receptivity in oneself to oneself and being a transmitter of sorts, and beyond that, being open to what the forces of life are at that time, whether it's walking through the city from home to studio or traveling or, you know, seeing a great meal or something, you know, harder or tougher than that, you know, experiencing any, any part of the world. It feels to me like a, a lot of people who do have an inspiration or something comes to them and they want to, they want to like flow it through and put it out on the canvas or on the page or in their music, that there's something that like tamps it down. It, it, it's like an inner critic or an is it good enough or um, so so do you have practices that help you be this sort of channel and interpreter 
I imagine that comes with a long life of creating art. How do you allow the flow to happen when those voices arise? Or do they even arise for you? They, they do arise. I can't say for everyone. I can't speak for everyone, but I, I wouldn't doubt it. And the first practice would be to see it for what it is, a tampening down, a denial, a denial of that force, and then to work against that. And when there's urgency in one's situation, there are times when when I have to paint and I can't be stopped. There are other times when it's more, what do I want to say? It's, it's I do it and I want to do it, but it's not urgent. And in those times is when it's easier to be critical because the time frame is different. And so really to recognize it and deny it and to work quickly. I mean, I love working quickly, meaning to work sequentially on small paintings or canvases to warm up and to not be attached to the outcome of those things. And then the pouring paint was definitely a direct result of that kind of, well, there were, there were two things, but that kind of uh, voice that comes up, the pouring would circumvent anything because it wasn't even me really. It was just, there wasn't an ego attached to it. It was just what happens when paint paints itself. And for that, I think back to the Chinese painters, the scroll painters, the land, the mountain water landscape painters, Shan Shui, where artists trained as calligraphers to be able to unite gesture and image in one mark, which was usually a flower idiom or a tree idiom or some kind of landscape language that derives from calligraphic marks reconfigured into a landscape framework, that there's something in that in that capturing of form through the life force of the pressure of the hand that is magical. And I have practiced Chinese painting for that purpose because it's nothing but a preparation for an execution that is spontaneous and ideally filled with life. But if not, throw it away and try another one because the materials are, they're organic and they're disposable. I'm having a full body response to your playfulness and to this, like, it's just so excited. I'm very like alive and tingly. I I had a question around urgency. What does create urgency for you? Where does, what's the urgency about? The urgency is, well, sometimes it's physical that I need to pour. I absolutely need to, like I would imagine somebody needs to dance or we need exercise. You know, just just a pure dr- physical drive. Like if I don't pour pain, I'm gonna lose my mind. But other times it's emotional or psychological or circumstantial, historical, urgent events that drive me to it. Yeah, so let's talk about urgent events. And um, you agreed to do this show And as you know, the gallery portion and the curator portion is going to women's reproductive health. And it's a benefit. So we're super excited about that. We started planning the show a year ago. I know it doesn't feel like that when you're a month away and there's still a million things to do. I'm sorry, team. But we started planning the show. And that was before, you know, the real uh, backlash legally for women's rights happened. And even through the process of starting this company and all the things that I've done like I'm just starting to really get a sense of how much life in a female body has framed my experience in the world. And, and I wonder if you could speak to how it's framed your experience or your art or something along those lines. How are you relating to being in a female body now? I'm, I'm getting very excited and aggressive about it because I came of age at a time when the repressive toxicity of sexism was very much in play and it was very women were still appendages in a way to men and and the Roe Wade had been passed by the time I came of age and I was able to take advantage of that and so with recent events I'm dismayed and horrified at what I see as a drastic u-turn against everything we've worked for for all these years now As to aesthetics and painting, I grew up in a home, a nuclear family, in a decorated house with very um, sprightly designs, hence the lattice in my work and the flowers actually, because I, one time I came home from school and my room had been redecorated as a birthday present and redecorated in my mom's wonderful, but, and really matching patterned eye, Um, but it was a lot. It was a lot to take in. I wanted to draw pictures of David Bowie, but I had flowers and lattice. So when I went to art school, 
you know, it was a kind of a post-minimal time and it was a very heady time and I love art discussion. So I entered into it wholeheartedly, but I cut off that part of myself, the part of myself that grew up in a suburban home in suburbia with with wallpaper and, you know, ruffles and an iron bed that I felt like a princess in and all this girl stuff that was eschewed in, in as not a serious intellectual endeavor. At the same time, pattern and decoration was probably raging at that time, but I was too young to appreciate the pushback of that movement, which focused on global patterning and de- decorative art techniques, and also in favor of everyone, not just men, not just women, but all people, um, according to the basic tenets of feminism. So that was the backdrop. And so returning to that now, with the physical implementation of pouring paint, which is just something I love to do, and one discovers things about one's process as we go on, but to bring that aesthetic aggressively into my work, or exuberantly, I should say, because I don't feel ex- aggressive as much as I just want to let it out. And I think it's important that it come out now because because of all this backward thinking and the separation that's beginning to occur, preventing more equality. You know, there's something in, it's a new idea for me, uh, around the push of feminism in the 60s and 70s, denying all of the things that were the purview of the of the of the, fe- of the feminine before that is like it, it it's a pushing away but it's also a denial of the lineage that brought you forth like you had all of these domestic arts and you had catering and how to make a good martini and how to put up wallpaper and how to put up like I don't know I don't know what you had because I wasn't there <laughs> but like what I see in movies tells me that but that there's something in like we don't want that anymore we're going to push that away that is like um in trauma in trauma work you you sort of look at transgenerational transmission and that you cannot actually heal until you accept and integrate your lineage otherwise you're just suppressing it and running away and so there's something really interesting in the way you're bringing those patterns forth that speaks to an integration period that I like. Thank you for that, because I, I agree with you, and it feels quite right to me, you know? And it was through Chinese paint. It, I became very interested in Chinese painting as a vehicle to describe a landscape very close to the landscape I grew up in, which is Los Angeles. Hmm. And then... I went to, Ch- so I became very interested in Chinese painting. I was teaching in Florida, um, and Florida reminded me of LA in the 1960s. So there was this whole discovery of landscape, and with it, Chinese painting, and with it, then I started going to China. And I was in Shanghai for six months in t- 2014, and it was at that time that I started to realize that scrolls and wallpaper were pretty much the same thing. But one was made by literati men, privileged, trained, you know, government officials. And the other one was made for, you know, the burgeoning decorative movement in the 20th century in the United States, borrowing from every other culture in the world, but somehow remixing on the walls and kind of in this fast and disposable version. And once I made that connection, and then living in New York, where nature is artificial. You can walk by Montclair, if that's how you pronounce the store's name, and see what the seasons are by what they're showing in the window, just as much as you can, you know, walk up down the street and feel the weather. They're equal. So so it started to make a lot of sense to tie it all together or integrate. And then, of course, one rediscovers all the lost and pushed away parts of oneself, you know, wanting to fit into a larger paradigm that, in fact, could never work without losing those parts. So, and now it's imperative to not lose those parts, to to integrate and come whole because there's, I don't wanna say there's a fight, but I wanna say that it's important for everyone to have a voice and to speak with it fully. And that is the, that's the task, you know. I wanna relate that my, my stepmother was the first uh, management person at the Bell companies in the 60s the first female management person. She got such grief, like her her banker wouldn't meet with her one-on-one without a chaperone, you know, all kinds of things like that. But for the bulk of her early, of that part of her career, she was coached to dress for success, to basically wear a man's suit and a floppy bow tie 
and to cut her hair really short and be very simple and desexualize herself. And in that way, she advanced very quickly. But what I'm seeing now is women are saying, why do we want to masculinize and be part of a paradigm that has basically bankrupted nature and the planet and our families in so many ways that are critical for us? Why don't we try a new way? And that there's something about having to go, th- maybe maybe going through the fitting in to whatever power structure is in place, getting enough of a foothold before you can say, wait, why would I want this anyway? And then, you know, coming home to possibly a more genuine and authentic way of being. So the integration word may be the word of the day, I feel like. I agree with that. And, and, and integrating genders in oneself, too, which I think we can all do, taking another page from... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Speak to that. Speak to that a little bit. Good. Well, I'm thinking of the... Integrating gender. What does that mean? Well, I think... I mean, again, I'm just going back to Chinese culture and the Mogaoku, the, the caves, the Buddhist caves in the western China, Gansu province. I think the name of the town is uh, Duohong, Duhong. But there are these caves that were painted in 337 BC. And you go into them and they are held aloft. They're carved out of the mountainside. They're held aloft by pillars and they tell the story of Buddhism as it spreads from India through China and on towards Japan. And so they have these angels called ansaras that are painted on the ceilings that are both men and women. I believe that's the case. And I mean, my memory is fuzzy, but I think that what I remember about growing up in a nuclear family that was formed in the 50s was the, my parents relating to each other, my parents, two very full people, but relating to each, to each other through these socially prescribed roles that didn't really work for them, like, you know, the working dad and the stay-at-home mom, and they were both going crazy. And I really saw that. And I think of the Ansaras or any kind of genderless being or both or multi-gender being where there's capacity to embrace all parts of oneself without splintering off. And then I think about those very uh, generic nuclear roles and, you know, I I see the solution to the problem in, in the face-off between those two. Yeah, in, in Indian philosophy, the divine androgyne is a uh... Ardhaneshwara, it's half man, half woman. So it, it exists there too. I believe our future is in that. But you didn't, you have a, you, your partner is also an artist, right? Your husband? Yes. So you've crafted a very different kind of marriage than your parents. Oh, yes. Yes. I mean, we are devoted to the same thing, and times also changed in our favor. So, you know, that's just the luck of the draw in terms of our moment in history. But we met in graduate school. We had a big crush on Matisse and talked about Matisse constantly. And and um, we went to Chicago, so they have some great Matisses there. And um, it is a very, we don't even always live together. You know, we just really understand each other and do what we want. I mean, I'm in New York, he's in Florida, and we go back and forth and see each other a lot, but we don't feel tied to some kind of structure that doesn't make sense for us because we met as students, we were wide open, and we've always kind of kept that relationship going to being open and and not d- defining marriage through some prescribed idea. It's a, it really works. That's like uh, Alfred Stieglitz and George O'Keefe, right? <laughs> Didn't they have a relationship like that? It is. I love that. It, it, I wouldn't say it, he's not the Sven Jolly that, that uh, and I'm not trying to dismiss O'Keefe by saying so. Her talent was there from the start and it was his gift of seeing it. But I think that he, there are differences, let me put it that way. Um, but, but I think the friendship and the mutual respect is there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, we, we do spend a lot of time together. I mean, um, I wrote a poem once called The Impossible Union of Artists. I'll send it to you. <laughs> but, you know, I think, I mean, speaking to that very point, you know, the thing about that made it doable is that he wasn't tied to his ego. That's a rare gift. He's not tied to an idea of being a man that maybe used to make that union so difficult. Not that I'm trying to put it all on men, but we balance each other. Mm, I love that. So the I want to go back to the angels. I, I thank you for that detour into relationship land. Always exciting for me. <laughs> Figuring out how people do it, how they blend their rich and creative lives with intimacy and the dishes. <laughs> back to these androgynous angels in China. This love affair with China, 
I just, th- this influence keeps coming up as you're talking, and, and it really sounds like it's been a pervasive part of your work. So do you want to speak more about that before we talk about other things? Or Well, thank you. I grew up in a religion called Christian Science, and it is a Christian religion, and but it, it's the religion where people don't go to doctors. So there was this beautiful dimension of abstraction that I learned very early that things were a question in many ways of thought. And yet, at the same time, there were other things like prescriptive social roles that seemed, you know, unuseful or less free than what the philosophy of the religion would espouse. So, wittingly or not, I was looking for a total system where mind and body would not be separate, where spirituality would not be punitive, but a system that would work and integrate. And I found that in Chinese painting. Initially, it was the resemblance of Florida to Los Angeles, two landscapes of raking light and, you know, prehistoric foliage that took me to the magic place of childhood. But as I learned more about scroll painting, I realized that every aspect of, I should say, ancient Chinese culture would circle in on itself and and like the yin yang you mentioned at the beginning you know where the medicine the system is total so at you know at 10 o'clock you go to bed you clean the liver then you go to another part of the body and cleanse that as you sleep it's completely integrated it's not it's a part of your lifestyle it's not something you have to apply and so what turns out to be the union of image and mark in painting also turns out to be this philosophy that we are natural beings and we and nothing comes unnaturally and so the system just kept magnifying itself in and in feng shui in all of the different practices of you know different aspects of the of the life everything was just spiritual and material at once there was no there was no fissure between the two. And so I felt like I'd found something I could really sink my teeth into. And the practice of the painting, yeah, was just made that, made, grounded it in the body. Did you also get into Chinese medicine? I just read some books about it, but no, I didn't. I've never been to, maybe I have been to a Chinese doctor, but I, I haven't really gotten into it. Do you go to doctors now as an adult? When I have to, but I'm not an enthusiastic doctor goer. Totally, me too. I'd rather I'd rather do everything possible to stay healthy to avoid having to go to the doctor. Um, But there's a question in there. Like I, this is a detour from the art, but I think it's actually like a really interesting question about: Are we natural? Are we self healing organisms? What is the role of the professional physician? What do you do when you have an entire industry that profits off of pathologizing functions of the body that go sideways? You know, and so th- this is a very, this is actually a, a broader question, not just religious question about seeing doctors, but, you know, what is your relationship to your body? And when it has a, a problem, what's your orientation toward that? That is a very interesting question. And I would have to say that, I mean, I've never really thought about it like that. But I, of course, would look towards realignment in my perception before I did anything and take all the natural steps because I agree with you. And and that's Chinese medicine, too, to prevent it rather than to wait until it's too late. I am really outraged at healthcare in this country and outraged that things are the way they are. I mean, it's you know, what could, outrage is the perfect word. I, I could repeat it, but I think you know what I mean. So I think that I just to try to be preventative, just like what the question says, you know, there have been times uh, when I haven't been able to negotiate by myself and I've gone to see doctors, but otherwise I try to stay as healthy as I can. Did I answer your question? Yeah, kind of. And But also, it, it does speak to, I think you have in your artist bio some stuff around how we're related to nature, like or how our bodies are, you know, how, which is, it, it hits that point of medicine. But um, on the word outrage, uh, I also feel a sense of helpless, you know, for the system is so big and so intractable. And that when I feel helpless, I also feel outrage. And so I try to 
basically remove myself from that system and create a parallel system that will create health and talk to people who are of that mind. And that's not an integrated approach. But, you know, it does feel a little bit overwhelming. So anyway, how are we related to nature in our bodies? And how do you see that in your work? I think that form and formlessness are two sides of the same idea. And I suppose that this is a little bit like religious upbringing, but then also, I don't know, I think that that the form and formlessness are that we are essentially life force, and all things are alive. And we are part of those life forms. And I believe that thinking has has gone towards this anyway, which is very exciting, you know, like the life of trees and the networks, the networks between trees and all living and pollinators and you know how everything works. It's all interrelated and humans are not sovereign. Humans are a part of that. So I see it like I see it like that, like just it's evident. And I remember one time I was walking in the Grand Canyon, I was artist in residence there. So I had the place before 5 a.m. and after 9 p.m. to myself. And I remember taking a walk along the trail early one morning and there were deer, maybe elk on that trail. And we looked at each other. We both caught each other unawares, like before coffee. And we had that, and they looked at me and I looked at them and, and we both thought, oh my God, you are not my species, but here we are. And it was very... I just really felt that connection that, yes, you are alive and you are having your own life. And I am I am moving across your path, literally. And it, it's just so it's exhilarating. And I think that the form and formlessness idea translates to painting. I don't want images to be fixed so that they can't move like wallpaper for example, but I, but I, but I also, I want a state of, per- landscape is permeable. There's no one landscape. We drive a high, we drive 95 from New York to Florida. And the, and if we did that twice every year, the landscape would constantly be changing because of the construction or the demolition or the seasons. So landscape is dynamic and it's the container for all diverse things to coexist. I mean, that's what it is. So we're all inside of this bubble together, this bubble that is the that is the atmosphere of Earth. Do you know why I like talking to artists? Because they say stuff like that off the cuff. <laughs> <sighs> oh my God. People, do you hear this? Free your flowers. Get them off your wallpaper. Let them be alive. Elizabeth said, creativity is really just being alive earlier on in the show. And I just keep coming back to that. What do we do to be most alive and most present and most in the flow of what's happening? Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about what you're working on now, what's turning you on now in your work before we wind up? In the Since spring, I've been painting these paintings on paper of flowers. I've been thinking a lot about life cycles and, yeah, life and death. And the best way to address that right now for me is on these beautiful pieces of handmade paper that I order from the UK that are 16 by 16 inches. And I buy flowers from the bodega. I go to my apartment and I paint them. I set them up on a table and I paint them. And what generally happens is it takes me a couple days to circle them and to get to know their shapes and their colors and what I want to get from, you know, we're looking at each other, the flowers trying to do its job by blooming. And then I'm looking at it, just trying to understand what it is. And then as I start to paint it, so it reaches this moment of ripeness, that's usually when I begin, and then the flower withers and it even falls apart and I wanna hang on. You know, it's a test. So sometimes so I'll, sometimes after the flower is dead, I'll paint the flower from memory. Sometimes I'll capture it in its life cycle, like there'll be parts of the flower that are really young and then parts that are really old in the same painting. So I'm, it's kind of an exercise right now. I've got about 18 of them. And, and uh, so I'm still working on them and building them up. And that's something. And then I put the lattice in the background as a kind of, well, the flower and the lattice share the space, actually, because the lattice becomes this dynamic carving up of space, kind of like the stripes on the flower in the Rosebud Woman show. So there's all these different lifespans in the flower. And um, 
The, and then the and then it's set within these spatial interstices established by the lattice, and the lattice is kind of a life force that exerts itself for with and against the flower, um, and that is just really occupying me right now. Mm. What do you think would happen if you painted a self portrait with parts of you that were young and parts of you that are now and parts of you that are like that could be such a cool exercise. <laughs> It could be. I love. I mean, first of all, like the idea of capturing something in one sp- in one painting that has got parts of it over the course of four or five days. It's not like uh, you said you were a fan of Matisse, but you know the guy who did the ha- Monet, he did the haystacks, right? Yeah, where he was capturing them across the light, but he'd work like four canvases over the course of the day so that he could uh, get a sun a sunrise one and a midday one, and he wouldn't lose the work day. Right. But the idea of getting them all in one panel just I just I just love that and then also it just ties into this thing about being female being all of our ages at once and allowing the parts of you that are young and the parts of you like like I don't even know what I look like anymore frankly yeah because I look in the mirror and I just have like the lens of like I think I'm still 15 basically <laughs> I understand <laughs> that know. and I and I, I can I know I know exactly what you're saying um you know but I and I do maybe feel that way about the flowers that they could be, I mean, I don't know that they're self-portraits per se, but I think that they're mental portraits, like portraits of a consciousness. Yeah. And a, co- a consciousness that recognizes temporality and um, and like material decay in some, like right. the arising and the declension of our life. Beautifully put. And um, and that all things have this, like they arise as a pulse and they, and they move on, they move on and no grasping. Yes. I could talk to you for a long time. I really love this. <laughs> so I'm so thrilled. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. We're going to have a great time. I can't even tell you, like, between the artists who are talking and then uh, the speakers who range from political strategists to eco-spiritualists to, you know, women who are menopause doctors and sexuality experts, it's going to be a really rich gathering a and I like to think of it as more of creating a community portal because, yes, we're raising money and the ideas are important, but the connections between the people who come are really important to me. And I think you're going to really enjoy the people you meet and they will enjoy you. Thank you so much. I can't wait. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. I love sharing these stories. I love sharing this art. I wonder how your art making is coming. How's your creativity? What are you working on? What's alive in you? When you get really quiet, what are you sensing in the field? All right, I'm going to ask you again. Will you please come to the Sensing Woman show? You can attend online. You can attend in person. You can purchase art. You can donate. You can offer gifts and services for our VIP bags, our guest bags, our speaker bags. Anything that you can do to contribute to this intersection of art, culture, multidisciplinary collision, community, all in the hopes of shifting the narrative around women's health, women's embodiment, and how we make a much more beautiful and just future for everyone. You can find me at the.rose.woman on Instagram or at Rosebud Woman, my company that makes beautiful intimate wellness products. We'd love to see you or visit us at rosewoman.com. It's the purchases you make there that enable the show and that enable things like Sensing Woman to happen. Remember, you are nature, born perfect, born knowing exactly what you were to become. It's nothing to fix or change, just love. Have a beautiful, beautiful day.